Hi, welcome to chapter four, the internal assessment. So in chapter three, we talked about the external assessment. In chapter four, we're gonna look more internally into the company. We're gonna look more about the, the strategies the company has laid out and how that can connect to an internal assess assessment, which is really looking at the role of management in the company, the role of marketing in the company, the role of finance and accounting inside the company. And moving forward into thinking about the information systems the company uses to collect and process the data, organize the company's uh, accounting books, purchasing, delivery, and explain how in, an internal factor evaluation or an IFE matrix can help better uh, employees better understand the internal strengths and weaknesses of a company. Now, at this particular point, uh, as we look into, you know, chapter four, we're good, we're at this point of the map. So we did the business <clears throat> business vision and, and mission statement. Then we looked at the external assessment, and now we're doing the internal assessment, um, which is important to really before you start modifying your strategies or before you're making any big decisions, you definitely have to um, do the external assessment and the internal assessment. So like I said before, this chapter focuses more on the internal assessment and one of the best ways to get started is to do an internal audit. And this internal audit is about getting the data. So you're gathering information that's going to help you to better understand the performance of the firm's management, marketing, finance, accounting, production, operations, research, development, uh, information systems, and you want to uh, do an internal audit that's going to allow participants to understand how they're doing in their jobs, how the departments are performing, how their division fits into the whole firm. So the internal audit is really, you know, collecting the data on different matrix, looking at data against benchmarks and trying to really assess improvement in performance or areas where there's some weaknesses and, you know, so we're basically, we're trying to look at the strategic plans and see, you know, how they're affecting all the way, trickling it down all the way to the employee. Over the next three sides, slides, we're going to talk about the RBV, research based view. So this is going to look at internal resources that are more important for a firm than external factors in achieving and sustaining competitive advantage. Now, um, when we're talking about this competitive advantage, um, we want to, you know, focus on the internal resources that are going to, you know, can be utilized and how well they utilize. So proponents of this <clears throat> research based view theory, you know, they basically are saying the firm's performance is going to be determined by the quality of their internal resources, <clears throat> excuse me, that enable the firm to exploit opportunities and neutralize threats. So what, so thinking about it, you know, what I'm trying to say here is what do we have as an organization that we can use to become more profitable, to become more competitive? And it's going to break up into two particular groups. Uh, what we have is the, the tangible and intangible groups that we can put these resources into. Now, so a firm, you know, if you look at the firm's resources that are more tangible, we're going to talk about labor, capital, land, plant, equipment. Um, so labor is, of course, the, the human resources, the people that work for the company. The capital is the money that the company has to work with. Land and plant and equipment are all physical assets that the company has. Now, intangible assets could be the company's culture. Are they a, is it an innovative culture? Is it a resistant re culture? Is it a resilient culture? The culture of the company will make a big difference, like the personality of the company. So you know how some people are go-getters and type A personalities, and some people are quiet quitters, and companies have a personality too that makes up from the group of the body of people that work within the company. The knowledge of the company, which can, is contained within the employees and the legacy uh, records that the company maintains. 
the brand um, recognition, the brand reputation, just the strength of the company's brand, which is basically a brand is just a group of products under a similar name. Any intellectual property that the company may own, uh, these are all intangible. Also intangible could be, if you think of Disney, a big intangible asset that they have are their characters. So the characters are basically, until you know, their their trademarks or their you know um, in, um, intangible property. They're not real people or real things, but these characters are what make up the stories that drive Disney's content, which then drives their platforms. Um, so since tangible resources are more easily bought and sold, it's it's easier to, to put a, a value on them, and it's you know. But the intangible assets are really what's more important for gaining a sustainable competitive advantage. The intangible assets are sometimes the assets that are hardest for other companies to duplicate. You know, so if you're, you know, um, Warner Brothers and you have DC comics like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, nobody else can use those characters in stories or movies. So this is an intangible asset, a competitive um, strength, a competitive advantage that no other company has because they don't have those three characters. So a resource, um, you know, for this to be considered valuable, it has to be rare, hard to imitate, and not easy to substitute. So that's what makes a resource more valuable. Um, so these three characteristics of resources enable a firm to, you know, leverage them in their strategies to improve you know, some aspect of their of their company, either in their efficiency, their effectiveness, their, you know, enhancing their competitive advantage. Uh, so now a resource, um, we hope that it's rare. That means that, you know, not many firms are going to have it. It's hard to imitate, which is not easy for another firm to copy. And it's not easy to substitute with a different product. So um, this is what builds a firm's competitive advantage. And the more um, difficult it is for competitors to obtain a similar resource, the stronger this competitive advantage is. Um, so valuable assets comprise strengths that the firm can capitalize on to really grow in the industry. So the, so the premise of this resource-based view is, you know, this theory is basically, um, it's gonna look at the firm's internal resources and be able to really list I know how the strategies of the company can take advantage of the firm's resources, which includes competitive advantage. And competitive advantage is really something the company does extraordinarily well that few other companies can match. You know, whether it's the amount of content. So Netflix competitive advantage is, um, they have a few competitive advantages. One is the ability to uh, uh, create so much content uh, in a short period of time. Uh, they're, they're also have a competitive advantage of having the largest base of subscribers in the streaming world. So there's, um, whereas Disney has a competitive advantage on their characters and properties that Netflix doesn't have. So Disney has a competitive advantage of having the Marvel superheroes, the Star Wars universe, the Disney princesses. Um, they also acquired Fox, which gave them properties like The Simpsons, The Predator, Aliens. Uh, so they have a lot of IP, which is intellectual property, that um, Netflix just doesn't have. And that's Disney's competitive advantage. Okay. So let's look at key internal forces. So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on distinctive competencies. Now, so these internal strategic um, assessments that companies are going to run is hopefully is going to help to identify um, distinctive competencies. And so each functional area of a business, you know, whether, you know, you're talking about the management, marketing, accounting, finance, information systems, they hopefully they're, they're going to possess some sort of um, distinctive competencies. Uh, and these are going to be strengths. So these are strengths that cannot be easily matched or or imitated by competitors. So there's distinctive to the company. So a distinctive, you know, compen you know, competencies are something where the company's known for it. So it's it's um, it's you know a very strategically important 
in the planning to capitalize on these strengths, uh, to nurture these strengths, grow these strengths, and utilize them in you know moving forward as far as what the company plans to do. Now, if there are any areas where the company's not doesn't have a strength, they then they generally want to work on improving this area, um, or perhaps trying to develop a competitive advantage in that area. You know. Um, It's, in these in these competitive advantages of distinct competencies can be small things too. It could be in the way the company innovated their customer service, such as um, you know Costco's early innovation of you know accepting anything back from customers without complaint, uh, warranties, their, the way they advertise, their packaging. Some companies' packaging is just so superior it really sells the product. Um, their pricing or their, how they market and advertise their products. These can all be distinctive competencies that companies have or that they're very good at. And, and companies need to prioritize these strengths, recognize them and, you know, promote them moving forward. And this is how companies build their competitive advantages off of, they start with these distinctive competencies and then they start making strategies around them to get the most out of these distinctive competencies. And that's what helps to build um, this, their competitive advantage by taking, um, by take, making the most of what they're good at. And if you look at any company that's successful today, they have to have been good at something to get there because there's so much competition in the world and there's so, um, there's so many ways to compete that, you know, just having a few things that are uniquely identifiable to your company can really push you to the top. And I guess <clears throat> let's move on to more functions of management. And these consist of four basic activities, planning, organizing, motivating, controlling. So this is the management of the company. And this is important because the management are, you know, these are the people who are going to, you know, lead the company. So planning, of course, you can understand how that's very essential, um, you know, to being successful as a company. Companies are not going to be successful unless they have planned out, you know, what it is they want to do. Um, so when we're thinking about planning, this is going to help the company to, you know, focus on what <clears throat> is the critical things that need to get done. And it's going to help ensure the company's prepared for you know different eventualities that may come to pass that they need to adapt to it's going to help planning can help gather resources that are needed bef uh, before that hopefully obtaining these resources before they're needed in the most cost effective and efficient way planning can help conserve resources avoid waste um, it can help access um, and evaluate efforts and costs and implementations of projects, um, anticipate, you know, future change. So planning is just really, man, you know, planning out what the company is going to be doing, looking to past successes or past failures, incorporating them in, improving, um, and just generally looking at what the company's mission statement is, their vision, and making a plan that's going to help the company get to the future. So. Without planning, a company is going to be very unorganized. So planning is really the first step um, to develop how the, a path for how the company is going to move forward. And hopefully, the, um, a big part of planning, of course, is going to be the forecasting. Forecasting sales, forecasting customer demand, uh, de um, hopefully developing new products and forecasting their effect on the company. Once you know what the company is going to sell or what they're going to plan to sell, then you can establish objectives along the way to get those products to market or enhance the market, the, the depth of that market and devise strategies that are going to, you know, overall increase the sales and profitability of the company. And then hopefully those strategies will come in the form of policies and make it clear to employees what they need to get done. Now, planning is not going to be successful unless the company is well organized. So organizing is another basic function. You know, um, organizing, if you look at job specification, job description, control, coordination, job design, job analysis, this organizational design is very important. Even if you look at a company 
Um, if you take two companies that serve coffee and breakfast related items, you have, you have Starbucks and McDonald's. Now Starbucks is, has struggled with the organization of how they prepare their foods and how baristas put the coffees and specialty drinks together. And they've been, they've realized the weakness in the amount of time and effort it takes to um, complete some of the specialized or customized orders for customers. Where McDonald's has a competitive advantage in the flow, the design and the efficiency of their kitchens and their service. So McDonald's could probably service 10 company customers in the time that Starbucks can service five customers. And that gives them a distinct advantage. But Starbucks has recognized this and they're working to better design their coffee houses, their, their kitchen areas, um, the function of their employees to make it more efficient in the making of their products. One thing that companies have to be careful of is they don't want to lose that distinct flavor or that distinct um, quality of the product by trying to speed up the production of the product. And, you know, McDonald's was heavily criticized in the past for efficiencies such as utilizing, incorporating microwaves and incorporating highly prepared aspects of their food, which some people complain took away the taste or quality of the food over time. Okay, motivating. So managers have to do a good job of motivating. A demotivated employee is one that's going to quietly quit. You want the leadership has to be in a position where they can commun effect, communicate effectively to their employees. They need to be able to organize people in a way that they'll work best. And sometimes it's designing work groups, putting the people together that would be most productive together. It's rewarding, you know, people's success and commitment. Um, it's in some case delegating authority, sometimes giving an employee who is underperforming a little extra authority may give them just enough pride in uh, motivation and confidence to do better. Uh, now, and your employees are going to leave if the job isn't satisfying, if the job isn't enriching their life, if they aren't learning and growing. So part of motivating people is there needs to be some sort of fulfillment in their work. Um, so employees morale. Uh, is going to be reflected on how they're growing, developing, and being rewarded at the company. And the management morale is really going to be the first. If the management aren't psyched about working at the company, if the management aren't happy to be there every day, then it's going to be difficult for employees to, uh, to be so themselves. If that motivation, if the managers don't start with the motivation from their internal spirit, there's going to be a real problem. Uh, later on. Okay, and controlling. So of course, con managers need to control. They have there in some cases, they could be control freaks, which is bad if you exercise too much control. But the managers really need to have a plan where there's quality control on the product. And I remember, this is something that if you, you know, managers have to care to the point where they can identify where there's a problem in the quality. Maybe it could be in food service where somebody's preparing food for customers. Maybe it's a, um, you know, a restaurant or it could just be a movie theater or it could be uh, any establishment where food is being prepared. And, you know, some employees are just <clears throat> getting the job done, but not really thinking about uh, or caring about what they're doing. So a lot of times if I ever worked in a situation, I would tell employees, you know, if you're making this, make it as if you were going to eat it. You know, put the care into it as if you were going to consume it, you know, really, you know, give people the, you know, they're paying a lot for this. Make sure that they get the quality they deserve for the food you're serving. You know, so it's just really sometimes controlling is changing people's mindsets. Uh, but controls have a lot to do with uh, having procedures or having equipment so you can do quality control. So you can test the product. So you can review the product. Having financial controls. So money isn't just spent here and there and with no control, no oversight. Having uh, inventory control, making sure that inventory isn't being stolen, wasted or spoiled, that inventory is being ordered in the proper quantities to get for production to continue. Uh, controlling expenses. So when you're someone who's not paying for the expenses, 
you probably don't think about them as much. So maybe you're living at home and you're younger with your parents and you're leaving the lights on, you're leaving your desktop computer on, your game system on, and you're wasting a lot of power. Why? Because you're not paying the electric bill. So what do you care? And maybe your your parents are coming down and always telling you, turn off the lights or you know, shut down the computer if you're not using it. And you feel like, oh, your parents are such a drag, they're always on your case. But they're trying to control expenses because electric bills can be, you know, in the hundreds of dollars a month. So financial managers are going to have to exercise concepts or get or help motivate people to control expenses. So, you know, one good thing a manager can do is that, you know, if they set a benchmark saying these are our expenses that that we're expending as a department and say, if you come up a way with to save money, we'll give you a 10 percent reward of the total savings. Uh, so that's an important thing to motivate people. Analysis of variances. This is really looking at, uh, so you might have an idea of what it costs to make a product. A variance would be if it costs any more or any less than forecasted or expected. So these always need to be investigated. Why did the cost go up? What happened that made this more expensive? Uh, of course, rewards and sanctions as far as, you know, encouraging better behavior and, um, uh, this um, discouraging bad behavior, you know, or bad things that you don't want to be repeated. Um, okay, so let's look at production operations. So let's think about this this a little bit more. So what is production operations? Well, basically, it's the part of the company that's going to make the goods. So they're going to take the inputs. If it's a physical company, they're going to take the raw materials, they're going to add labor to it, and they're going to come out with some finished goods to sell. If it's a, you know, a service company, um, they're going to you know, enhance a particular aspect of a service uh, through labor, through providing contact with customers. So really, whatever the activities are needed to transform form raw inputs into a goods or service. So production operations are going to deal with those inputs, those transformations. Uh, and this varies between different, of course, different markets, different products. I mean, some production is very complicated, like producing airplane or automobile. And some production is much more simpler, like um, uh, producing, you know, um, maybe producing tires or producing popcorn or <clears throat> there's so many products in the world. And it's really, um, can be so specialized in the production aspect, but um, integrating strategy and culture. So you have, you have the strategy of the company, you have the strategy of the companies trying to pursue, of course, which we talked a lot about. So how do you integrate culture well, culture is not an easy thing to always understand what that is. So each business has this unique fin fingerprint that's their culture. And hopefully the culture of the company that's been developed or cultivated over time is in alignment with the, the strategy. If it's not, it might require training. It might requ require um, ex external education. Um, but somehow you want to emphasize that the importance of matching the company's external and internal factors um, with its strategic strategic decision. So if you do a good job matching these factors of the company, it should naturally align and capture the company's culture um, in a way that employers are going to work together to achieve the strategic goals. Uh, so, for example, if your company is based on uh, maybe it's a company that makes vegan food products and the culture of the company is really, you know, um, a collection of people who care about um, this, you know, having a diet that is vegan and they care about, you know, what that means for the planet, how that relates to animals. So if you have a lot, a lot of like-minded minded people working at the company and really get why vegan food's important, that's gonna build a, a company culture that will help better innovate products, sell products, design products, you know, align with all this, 
the strategies the company is trying to pursue moving forward. So organizational culture is, of course, um, something that a company can cultivate. It, it's, a, it's something that over time, when you're hiring, you're looking for people that fit the company culture, that fit the behavior of the company, the way the company is organized, um, how the company is going to you know, integrate uh, or adapt to change, strengths, weaknesses, um, how the company can teach this culture to new employees, how to think about how the corporate culture thinks and feels. And so it's really, it's really a hard thing to always describe what each company's culture is. And generally employees have, if, if the organizational culture isn't well understood by the employees, meaning that management hasn't effectively reinforced it or stated it or established it or talked about it, the more that the company makes the culture a known, a discussion, uh, reinforces the culture or the culture that they want to have, the better they can hire people that fit the culture, the better that they'll have an alignment between the culture and the strategy of the company. Uh, and if you've worked for, a lot of companies have a toxic culture. So a lot of companies, they neglect their, um, the culture. They don't do anything to foster a positive culture or hire to improve their culture. And they often develop a negative toxic culture. And some companies can go, go along and they can still make profits and they can still be a company that's profitable, but they're really not going to reach their potential with a negative, um, toxic culture. And it's something that, you know, a lot of companies have to, um, recognize and break free of, and it's not an easy thing to do. It's very uh, difficult. Here are some aspects of a company's culture that you can kind of think about How, what's the work ethic at the company. You know, people arriving early, leaving late. Uh, I don't think that's as much of a concern these days. Rather, I, I would be more concerned about how hard do people work while they're in the company? Are they goofing off a lot? Are they wasting time on Facebook or on their cell phone? Are they really working diligently the hours are there? So I don't really think in today's world, coming in early or leaving late is a good organization of a strong work ethic. I think a good strong work ethic is you're balancing your work and your life in a way that work is satisfying. And you value work in a way that you work hard the hours you should be there. And let's say it's nine to five. So you're not, you know, I've, I've seen people stretch your hours out an extra two hours a day. So they're there eight to six. And, but they're doing less work than someone's there that's there nine to five. So it's really about what you get done in the time you're there. You shouldn't be late and you shouldn't leave early, but you shouldn't really also have to be. I think one of the toxic cultures that I was talking about is these company cultures where they expect you to come in early and stay late, you know, just so it looks good. That's toxic. But you want a company culture, strong work ethic, meaning that the hours that they're there and being paid for, they're working to the best of their ability. Um, ethical beliefs, you know, um, company has a strong code of ethics that people are actually acknowledge and follow. And you've hired a collection of very ethical people. Um, now, how the company dresses? Is it a formal dress? Are, are they wearing shirts and ties and suits? Now, this, this is part of the company culture, but it doesn't have to be a formal work environment. A lot of companies have discovered that having a more informal, a more casual dress in the work environment makes employees feel more comfortable. And when employees are more comfortable, they typically work better or work more consistently. Um, so there's been a huge change in the thinking that, you know, the more the, the more dressed up your workforce is, the, the better your workforce is. And they really have turned it on its on its head these days where it's not about how well dressed your workforce is. It's about how comfortable they are um, so they can get the work done. Um, socializing outside of work, you know, does the company have a culture where the uh, employees are, are friends with each other enough that they would want to join social activities the company organizes outside of work, or just they might organize these social activities themselves. Um, how, um, how, how, how employees question their supervisor's decisions. Uh, in a respectful way, in a helpful way. 
Um, so respect could be a big part of company culture. Uh, how, you know, how the company is open to what they say call whistleblowing, which is basically if a manager or supervisor is doing something wrong or some aspect of the company is not aligned with their goals and their ethics, that employees feel comfortable and protected to come forward and, and let upper management know. Um, how healthy a company is, what, you know, how they support employees health and well-being by having a health fair or maybe having um, good medic a medical sy system, med uh, ins health insurance, things like that. Um, allowing employees to work from home, you know, um, constantly it's been shown that for a lot of people, they work better from home than in the office. You know, in the office can be a very stressful, demanding environment, distracting environment. So sometimes a company needs to be flexible, allowing some people to work from home. Encouraging creativity, innovation, and open-mindedness. This is critical. I've worked for a number of companies where my opinion was not solicited. And if I gave my opinion on products or campaigns or concerns, I was shut down quickly. Why? Because upper management wanted everything to be from their ideas. They wanted all the credit. So they didn't want to hear about any employee, any other employee's ideas for a new product or for a new advertising campaign. You know, if it's not your job, then shut up up is basically, I left the word out there on purpose, but basically how some toxic cultures are. They just don't want to share, you know, the success of the company with anybody else's ideas. And that's a, you know, very toxic, uh, negative culture. Um, supporting um, diversity is an important thing at companies. Make sure people are being treated fairly. Um, being a company that's socially responsible and gives back to communities. Um, companies that have responsible meetings where the meetings aren't wasting people's time. The meetings aren't something that could have been done in the email. Just something that uh, meetings where they're effective, efficient, and not wasting people's time. Um, having a management style that's open, that's cooperative, participates, you know, having seen the managers that get involved in the business and put, don't are not afraid to get their hands dirty. Um, and creating, and of course, conserving energy, promoting a natural environment, having concern for the climate. These are all things that can, can help better define a company's culture. Um, here's a, so here's an audit checklist. Um, that management can have in their audit. So these are things that they should ask themselves or, or kind of incorporate into an internal audit of the company for managers. One, does the firm use strategic management concepts? Very straightforward. Do they have a strategy? Are they using the basic contents of this book? Are they employing that? A lot of, a lot of managers are never had a strategic management course. They don't know how to uh, implement strategy. Are companies' objectives and goals measured well and communicated? Very important. Measuring, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you have to be able to manage through measurement. How effectively is the company doing? What are the improvements? What are the benchmarks? Do managers in all hierarchy levels plan effectively? So basically the managers working well together on their planning. You know, are they working in silos? Or are they working together? Um, do managers delegate authority where it makes the most sense? Are they delegating authority well? You know, a manager that micromanages everything and tries to do everything himself or herself is going to fail. Um, is the organizational, organizational structure, the organization, organization, sorry, structure appropriate? Meaning, is it the best design for where the, man, the departments are, the managers are, the supervisors are, how the departments are laid out? Uh, has it been, you know, is it back from the 1940s or have they redesigned it to a more current organizational layout? Uh, job descriptions and job specifications, are they clear? Do people know what they're responsible for or what they should do? Um, you know, this is very critical. A lot of times um, employees might be asked to do things by other managers that are out of scope of their job description or responsibilities, and it's something they not should not be doing, and other managers are taking advantage of them. But employees, sometimes employees are too nice, and they just want to say yes to anything a manager tells them, but they really do need to go to their manager and say, hey, these other managers are asking me to do this and that. You know, can you prioritize the work for me and tell me what I need to work on? Um, how is the employee morale? Is it high? 
employees feeling good. How do you measure that? You can do a survey. You can, you know, there, there are different ways to measure it, but a lot of times it's a feel. You know, uh, when you're walking the floor, you're walking the offices and you see how people, are they smiling? Are they talking? Are they communicative? Or do they look angry or pissed off or, you know, mad about things? And you can just ask them, like, what's on your mind? What's bothering you? Uh, employee turnover. It, are, are you constantly running through employees? That's a bad sign. Are, you know, a lot of people absent a great deal? Another bad sign. Organizational rewards and control mechanisms. How do employees get rewarded when they do good work? How do they get corrected if they're not living up to expectations? Okay, let's move into marketing. So I think we all understand the basics of marketing. Now, for me, marketing, I like to think of it as really, there's a advertising side and a marketing side. And a lot of it on the advertising side, that's the creative side where you're creating um, and you're, um, giving advert, you're creating advertisements, you're creating demand, you're creating a desire for your products. You're trying to fulfill customers wants and needs on the marketing side. I see that more of you're trying to design, uh, measure matrix, statistical, uh, mathematics to look at the effectiveness of advertising and trying to marry up demographics with sales figures. And, uh, it's a little bit more mechanical, but I guess marketing could kind of be, you can think of it, let me just think of these five basic marketing activities. <clears throat> you got your marketing research and um, market analysis. So the marketing research and marketing analysis, of course, the research is doing the work to get the data you need to help analyze, you know, how your goods can be sold. Uh, so the research is really who, who are the, who's buying your products? Who's, who could potentially buy your products? Um, there's just a lot of demographic detail out there. There's a lot of research about um, your goods, the competitors, um, products that compete with your products. There's so much marketing research that can be collected and analyzed that you really need um, market research analysts to put this data together and present it to the company. So a target market analysis is going to come out of that market research where you examine, you know, who are your customers, who you're trying to sell to, what are their needs and how you're satisfying them. Um, now we also have uh, product planning. So this is going to be really a company continually needs to move forward and develop new products and services, uh, enhance existing products. So that might require, require a lot of um, development of new products, testing, <clears throat> um, doing market testing for new products to see if customers like it, um, how to position the product in, in, in brand positioning. Is it going to be a high-end brand, a low-end brand? Is it, you know, uh, how's it going to fit in with what the company is currently selling? Thinking about the, the aspects of the warranty, the packaging, uh, some companies will put a product in what's called an IFC, an individual folding carton, basically a box. And when you take a, a bottle of something uh, and you put it in the box, it feels like a present. It feels like something special, something you're opening. It feels like something more protected. And also a box may give you more surface area to promote the product or describe the product to the customer because the whole box can be, uh, there could be detailed writing and logos all over the box. So it's a, just another way of enhancing the packaging, uh, determining the you know product features, style, quality. Um, sometimes it's time to refresh old products or discontinue old products, and how to better match customer service. You know, for example, there are some products that they found that customers want an expiration date on the product, even though the product may not expire for twenty years. They want to see that the product. It has a long shelf life. Uh, so that's an expectation that's not required, but you might provo provide it because customers are expecting it. So if you're developing a new product or you're diversifying your existing line of products, the product planning is critical for companies to be successful. And if pro all companies need to refresh their product lines, rethink new products and services moving forward to keep their company alive and growing. 
Now, pricing. Pricing is another important aspect. Um, trying to figure out how much to charge for a product. Um, what is the inherent value of the product? So the cost of the product is one thing. So you always want to sell at a cost above the price of the product. And that's, that's critical and important. But also you want to look at what type of value add does this product have that, you know, people be willing to pay. How much would people really be willing to pay for this product? So maybe you're making an iPhone that costs the company $200 to manufacture, but you figure people will pay $1,000 for this because it's so much utility and it's so much, so competitively packaged in features and performance. So the pricing strategy is going to be one where um, we're going to be a high-end product. We're going to be an expensive phone. And there's demand for this. Customers want this demand. Um, this fills customers' needs. That's why when you look at cars, they come in all pricing levels from cars that cost you know, $25,000 to cars that cost $500,000 because there's a pricing, there's a customer for most prices. And if there's a customer that will pay a certain price, you and there's enough of them, you might want to make a, a product to fill that pricing void. Uh, promotion. So how how do you get customers to know about your product? Well, that again is a marketing activity that involves the sales, um, promotion, advertising, commercials, print, sales promotion, coupons, public relations. Uh, personal selling, people uh, personally selling the product person to person, door to door, direct marketing, marketing direct to consumer. So um, a lot of common promotional tools, advertising on the internet, on TV, on magazines, billboards, websites. Um, this is where the promotion comes in. So you have a great product. It performs well. Customers like it. Time to let everybody know about it. That's the promotion function. Uh, district channels of distribution, how to get the, the product into the customer's hands. So some products you want to have on retail shelves, some products you want customers to buy directly from a website. Um, some products are sold through wholesalers, retailers, brokers, facilitators, agents, vendors. Um, so some, some companies start out selling products out of the trunk of their car, uh, selling products, you know, in a kiosk, then in a store, then in two stores, then in a hundred stores. So there's many different ways to distribute your product, but you have to figure out uh, what's the most cost effective and efficient way to get your product into customers' hands. What's most uh, convenient for your customer? Okay. Different marketing audit checklists that we can talk about. Um, we can talk about market segments. Uh, are they, so market segments are just making up different, um, different areas where uh, groups of people that could buy your product. And you want to make sure that your product can be segmented well. Um, how is your position as the organization among competitors? Are you last or are you first? Um, are, the, are your current channels of distribution reliable and cost effective? Or do you have to share a lot of those profits with somebody else? You know, for example, if you're going to release a movie in movie theaters, you have to share the box office with the movie theater. If you release a movie that's video on demand, you have to share some of that um, profits with the uh, demand channel it's coming through, whether it's a uh, cable system or um, or a direct internet system. Um, is a firm conducting and using market research properly, effectively? Sometimes you'd be surprised that companies don't. They don't really bother to reach out and get that, pay for that marketing research or conduct it themselves. Uh, product quality. And is, is the product quality high enough? Does it meet the customer's expectations? Are customer services good? Um, are the firm's products and services priced appropriately? Are they priced too low, too high? Um, have prices been raised too quickly? Do the, does the firm have an effective promotional strategy on how to advertise and market the, the product? Is the firm's internet presence uh, appropriate compared to competitors and compared to rivals? Do they have enough presence? Do they have a website? Do they have you know, the, the latest way of you know, utilizing the internet to sell the product? 
Okay, let's move into finance and accounting. So there can be three decisions here, investment decision, financing decision, dividend decision. So the investment decision, which we call capital budgeting, is a way for financial managers to, to look at um, what opportunities exist and evaluate their financial potential and the profit potential of these opportunities. So basically the way we do this is we look at cash flow. So we look at a new product, uh, a new project, a new asset, a new acquisition, and we see, okay, if we, if we merge with this company, we acquire this company, we, we move into this new area of products, what is the return to the company? What are the cash flows will generate versus the money that's going to be involved to get to get this going? So this is you know, just a basic investment return on investment. You know, so this has the financial managers have to crunch the numbers, come up with the, the, the dollar amounts, the costs of the new decision and the benefits, the cash flows. Now, the financing decisions determines how the company is going to raise money or capital. So capital is money for companies. Are they going to issue stock, issue debt um, from you know, bank loans, bonds? So there's various methods which, where a company could raise money and each method has a cost. So the company is going to often have to have a mix of funds to raise the capital to keep the company moving forward. And then eventually when the company is profitable, what are their dividend decisions? How are they going to return uh, or reward investors who are invested in the stock? And one way they can do it is pay the dividend. So they have to really determine what amount of funds they want to retain to grow the company and which, which the amount of the net income or the profits of the company they want to give back to shareholders. Okay. Um, so, so if we look at this, how each ratio is compared over time. So if we look at financial ratios, we want to do a ratio analysis of a company. So we're going to look at, when we do a ratio analysis, there's a set of financial ratios, which I'm sure has been covered in your finance class, your accounting class. So you're familiar with these financial ratios. How have they changed over time? How do they compare with the competitors or the industry averages? And how do they compare with your closest or key, key competitors? give you an idea of you know, the trends of the company. So if we look at these financial trends of the current ratio or the profit margin, we wanna see how our company is doing compared to the industry average. Are we better or are we worse? This gives us an idea of how well, sort of like a GPA of how well we're doing against our competitors. And you know, this, is, um, this is a list of uh, financial ratios which you know, you has been discussed thoroughly um, in other classes, and you can easily follow up with these on the textbook. So I'm not going to go into or talk about each of them individually, but basically they're just looking to measure the liquidity of the company. So you can kind of break up the financial ratios into five areas. Um, the liquidity of the company, which is going to be, uh, if I go back here, these are the liquidity ratios measuring how the company deals with the money that they borrow. Uh, the leverage ratios looks at the, the rate of borrowing to assets and equity. What's the, the percentage of money that is borrowed? What percentage of money is equity, which is basically retained earnings or money that's invested in the company through equity. Activity ratios are more management ratios. What is the activity of the company? How is Let's look at the inventory, the fixed assets, the total assets, the accounts receivable, collection period. So activity relates to how the company is uh, operating and the efficiencies of the operation. Profitability ratios are critical to most investors, most people buying the stock, and how you really measure the performance of the company. And it goes all the way from gross operational net profit margins to look at all three levels of the company, from selling the products to operating the company to the, to the end result, which are the net profits. And we can measure the return on assets, the return on equity, earnings per share. And the last group is going to be growth related uh, ratios. How, how, what is the growth in sales? And what's the growth in income, earnings per share, dividends per share, per share? So we're really looking at change. We wanna see the company, companies are like sharks. They have to keep moving forward. They have to keep eating and growing 
and becoming more and more profitable. Sales are increasing, profits are increasing. This is what customers expect and demand. And if the company can't produce that, the stock price will go down. So as a checklist for finance and accounting, we're looking at, um, you know, where are the weaknesses according to the financial ratio analysis? Uh, can the firm raise additional money through short-term capital? Can they raise needed money through long-term debt? Um, do they have sufficient working capital? Working capital is the difference between the current assets and the current liabilities. And it's just the money you have to operate the business. Um, is the capital budgeting procedure effective? So however you're evaluating your investments, are they coming out as you expected? What are the dividend payout ratios? Are they reasonable? Are they what customer, are they what shareholders expect? Do you have good relationships and communication with your investors? Um, are the financial managers well experienced and trained? Is the firm's debt situation appropriate for the size and age and strength of the company? Okay, so let's look at what are called information systems of the company. So this is definitely a way of company to gather information um, about the company and the, the computers are, are running these companies today in, in, in a certain aspect where they're collecting all the data, they're doing all the debits and credits and every step of the way, companies are usually run by a big program called uh, an ERP, Enterprise um, um, Reporting Program. And an ERP, is going to run the whole company. So it's gonna be involved in sales, marketing, um, purchasing, production, accounting, finance. It's just gonna really be there to record every transaction and have all the data. So the financial books of the company can be completed. So the order processing flow and the forecasting and the production of the company completed can be completed and recorded. And all this data can be analyzed so it can be collected, analyzed, synthesized into reports. This helps support management to make better decisions. So they know exactly, you know, what's the cost of the product? What is the time frame it takes to order the materials for inventory, to, to manufacture the product, to get it on the store shelves? Uh, what is the amount of returns? Who And the accounting side of it, every transaction is going to roll up to an accounting so you can see where the profits are by product, by department, by product line. So there's so much information that the information system is going to collect, but are, you know, is, is this a strength? Are you collecting the information correctly? Are you organizing reports that are useful and help managers make decisions? So this kind of leads into business analytics. So if you have collected all this data using this big software program that runs the whole company and is involved in recording everything the company does, can you take the, the uh, utilize this information with business analytics to help predict trends, to um, you know, mine the data and create uh, results that are, you know, and a lot of this can be done, it doesn't have to be an AI doing this or machine learning. It could just be getting the data from the system and manipulating in Excel to get a better idea of formulating connections or results of what companies, the results of companies. Um, sales and actions and decisions. Now let's talk about the internal factor matrix. This is the, you know, the internal factor, um, the IFE. So this is going to list the key internal factors as identified by the internal audit process that we've basically been talking about. And we could put a weight from a range of zero, not important, to one, most important, on each of the factors. And we can assign a rating, you know, say one to four for each factor, indicate whether or not the factor represents a strength or a weakness. Uh, multiplying each factor's weight by uh, its rating to determine a weighted score for each variable. And summing up the weighted score for each organization to determine the total weighted score for the organization. So, you know, this is... It's just a process, basically. So not all companies will follow this um, this matrix, but it is, you know, a comparative sort of like quick test that is going to help the company better understand where they are. 
you know, so if you look at these steps, you know, um, the key internal factors are the first thing you have to put together. And then the importance of these factors. And, you know, you're signing these ratings. Uh, to obtain this basically weighted system, so we just get a better idea of what the company's strengths are, how important they are, what their weaknesses are, how important the weaknesses are to the business. And this is going to be, you know, just basically give a result that can be done year over year. And we can compare these, uh, this matrix to see how the company's progressing over time. Okay, so just keep in mind, what is this chapter about? It's about a company getting to know itself getting to know their strengths, the weaknesses, the operations, the people that work for the company, all the tasks performed for the company, just to get an overall realistic idea of what are we doing well, what are we doing poorly? Let's enhance or fix the things we're doing poorly, make those uh, less poor. Let's look at our strengths. How can we make them even stronger? How can we capitalize on this? So it's, just, it's a process that doesn't happen once a year, but this is something that happens every day. In, in small ways, in large ways, and it's just a company continuing to improve to give it the best chances to be competitive, to survive and grow. Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I look forward to talking with you on chapter five coming up next. And in chapter five, we're gonna look at strategies and action. So we're finally gonna put together these external and internal factors and the, the strategic vision and the, and, the, and the mission statement together to see how we can actually turn those into strategies and put them into an actionable phase. So I look forward to talking to you then. Take care.